Dan, since you yes. are the veteran, tell I me am. your veteran story, what got you into the military, what happened to you in the military, sure. why you want to be a psychologist, yeah. specifically, I'm assuming, to work in a vet center or a VA environment where you well, can actually project do project refit. It. Yeah. Do one on one. Yeah, in, in a clinical, in a clinical uh, setting. Um, yeah, so I, I joined the, the Army. I was an infantryman in the Army. I joined um, May 6th, 2013. I was 23 years old. Um, I honestly, I, was, I just didn't have much going. I, was, I didn't have motivation. I didn't have drive. I, didn't, I was doing nothing, and I knew the military would probably provide that. So I, um, I, had, I had tried doing the Marines first, and uh, it didn't work out. I had a chest tattoo that I had before, so it wavers and stuff. Anyway, I went and did the army um, and I went to two months out of uh, AIT. I went to uh, Afghanistan, uh, Herat province, Afghanistan, uh, it's, it's west. Um, so I was infantry, I was brand new <clears throat> and we were, um, so I got blown up twice in Afghanistan. I was in two IEDs. One of them was uh, 200 pounds, it was the bad one. Um, so we were in Mat V's, it's like a, it's an up armored Humvee essentially. Um, and they have the V bottom holes. It's nice. We were driving in a wadi, which is a, it's the river just without the water. It's a riverbed. Um, uh, we were in that, they, the locals use it as a highway. We use it as a highway. Um, and our main road, the actual asphalt road, we were, it led up to that. There was a little ramp that went up and we were, we were on our exhale back home from a key leader engagement talking to one of the Afghan uh, army guys. It had just rained. Uh, and when the Taliban dig IEDs, the, the dirt on top is obviously softer than the dirt surrounding it. So when it rains, it creates a depression. There's a puddle. Um, I was the second vehicle in, in line. We had five vehicles. Um, mm -hmm. And you get taught to follow the vehicle in front of you. If, the, if that vehicle didn't hit a bomb, you're not going to hit a bomb. Chances. Chances are likely you're not going to. So when that lead vehicle had made its turn to go up onto the main road, nighttime, just got done raining. I, had, I have a habit of looking at people when I talk to them. So my lieutenant who, who was in charge of that vehicle, uh, we were talking about how we were the only platoon in, that co in our company who at that point in the deployment had not been blown up by an ID yet. So I turned to talk to him and that's when the lead vehicle had made its turn onto the main road. So I didn't see which tire marks were, the, were my vehicles and which were just the other vehicles in the area. Mm -hmm. So I had to make a, a guess and essentially turn and hope for the best. And when I turned, my back left uh, wheel uh, right over the pressure plate for the IED, the igniter for it. Um, and it blew the back left tire off. And those vehicles use jet fuel. So like, it's not as flammable as other things. It's not going to catch on fire as easily. But when that IED went off, it ruptured the fuel and the oil line. So that just set a fire immediately. In those vehicles, each door has a, a big metal lever. It's a combat lock. When, if, if you lock that from the inside, nothing's getting in from the out. So you're taught to whenever your vehicle stopped, you combat lock it. So we were driving. So, I mean, just in case something happened, you don't know. My door wasn't combat locked and the interpreters wasn't combat locked. Um, so when the ID went off, the uh, concussive blast blew those doors open. Um, my helmet, the strap just broke off and I hit my head on the uh, top of the, the vehicle. So I blacked out for, I don't, obviously, I don't know the, the, the time, under 30 seconds um, and my gunner, they're strapped in with a harness into the vehicle and it locks in. So just in case something like this happens, they don't get um, launched out. And the IED was just so big, so strong. It was the biggest one the entire deployment, even at the end. Um, it was just so strong that it snapped the harness. So he landed on the hood of the vehicle. He blacked out. He was he was unconscious. Um, so I was the only one left in the vehicle. The My lieutenant got out. The interpreter behind me got out. And the guy behind my lieutenant seat got out. So the radio mount, I couldn't, when I came to, I was on fire from like here down, about the waist down. Um, my door was open, so the fire was just billowing in. I was obviously in a fight or flight in a state of shock there. Um, so I turned to climb out of the uh, passenger side, but the radio mount was too, my gear was too bulky. I couldn't fit. And my immediate thought wasn't to take it off yet. I was still survival, I guess. Um, and I didn't want to jump out of the, the door because the fire was coming in there. Um, those IEDs are usually initiators for an ambush. So I didn't know if there was just a plethora of guns waiting for me. Um, and where there's one IED, there's usually two. So I didn't want to just jump out and get blown up right there. So my only option was to climb out of that passenger side door. 
um, in the vehicle, there was 100 rounds of 762 because that some just one of the dismounts left a uh, hundred rounds of seven, six, two in there. So that had started to cook off while I was in the truck. And then that vehicle was our uh, Mark 19 vehicle. So it had 620, 40 mic mics in it. Um, so after some point of screaming time frame and whatnot, um, Oh, so like in the movies, like the, where it shows the person getting blown up and they're, uh, they're on the verge of death and their life flashes before their eyes. That happened like legitimately happened. Blew my, I didn't, I couldn't remember after what the memories were because I knew when I was remembered them that, that they were uh, memories I hadn't accessed in a long time. Um, but the feeling that they gave me, it was like a calming feeling. So I don't know if that was my brain either preparing me to die or trying to make me fight for that last, hey, last hurrah. Um, and then the the dust settling, how it's in the movies, it's 100% accurate and I'm ringing in the ears, that's, ob <laughs> that's obvious. Um, but all of those things happened while I was in the vehicle on fire. Um, and then after, I don't know, under a minute, around a minute, who knows, um, the guy sitting behind my uh, lieutenant, he was like, yo, take your kit off, take it off, jump out, let's go, take it off. And then finally it, it clicked. Um, I took it off. So the guy that the guy that landed on the hood, the gunner, uh, him and I became really, really close after this. We will talk, we will tell. Um, but he... Uh, we had the same therapist and psychiatrist after Afghanistan. So I remember just screaming, I'm on fire, like a normal, like adult yell, you know what I mean? Um, where Bravo, that's his name, Bravo. He was, um, he was unconscious. So picture somebody burning alive, the, the blood curdling scream. That's apparently how I was screaming. My brain will not allow me to remember that, but that's what woke him up for him to, he, he, he got, so right when he woke up, I jumped out of the vehicle and I had no gun. I had no helmet. I had no body armor, nothing. I was like this, but in war. So he jumped on top of me and scanned the Wadi above us with his M9 to make sure uh, that we weren't getting ambushed, which thank God it wasn't an ambush. Um, and then we had to run to the, to the lead vehicle, which was like 75 meters ahead of us. And I mean, we were supposed to be being tactical, but I was in a state of chaos. I just sprinted as fast as I could for there. Not a great idea. Um, but as soon as we started running for there, the 40 mic mics that were in the uh, truck started exploding. Another 30 seconds in the truck. And I mean, who knows what, uh, what would happen. <laughs> so that's my, um, so that's what happened in Afghanistan. That's, that's one of the main contributors to my PTSD, one of the main causes of it. And then after Afghanistan, um, four months after Afghanistan, I went to Djibouti, Africa for seven and a half months. That was all well and good. Um, and then I came back and when I came back, I, uh, noticed some things were out of order. I noticed I wasn't as happy as I used to be. I wasn't, I wasn't me. So. After that second uh, deployment, I was in my barracks room with my friend. And you know that, you know that phone game Fruit Ninja? It's like, uh, yes. up and you, we played that in real life. So like I, he had a knife and I had a kiwi and I threw it up and he hit it and it hit me in, on my chest, right where my, my nipple is. And there was a wet mark. So he uh, jokes, so I, it turns out it, it, it was pus. My, my body was, there were so my hormones were, and my, my, everything was so out of whack that I was, it was pus. So um, I went to the doctor and he said, it's either brain cancer, testicular cancer, breast cancer, or stress. And like, I had a whole oh bunch goodness. of family stuff going on. I had, I mean, I had, I didn't even, I didn't even recognize Afghanistan as an issue at that point. So it was that on top of everything else. Obviously the cancer tests all were all clear. So, so I had to go to therapy one time. So I went and it was, um, I got one of the army, uh, like technicians. She was so sweet. She was so sweet. I'm happy that she was a, a nice person. Like if, if she was desensitized or anything, <clears throat> I probably wouldn't have received that as well. But, um, I just sit there and tell my story. I exactly what happened. She like cried. <laughs> and usually there's like a wait time to talk to an actual, I talked to a therapist that day. So through right when that started, James has had reached out to me. So this was in the beginning of me finding out about my PTSD, discovering what it was, how, how, what it meant, all of that stuff. Um, and I was looking online for um, a combat vet support group, something for, for something outside of the military but people who have been through what I've been through, I was focused on that. So I, I found this one, this one nonprofit, and, and it was a um, text. It was typing on the computer, and I got I got paired with a, in a guy who was in the Navy in the '80s who never saw combat. God bless him. I'm sure he could help me now. But at that point, I needed somebody who was combat. Um, I thought at least. 
So James and I had, we had a mutual friend on my leave back from Afghanistan, him and I met at the bar. Um, we added each other on Facebook and, and didn't really talk much after that. And then um, right when I had started therapy in 2016, yeah, um, he reached out to me and just simply asked what the, uh, what the army does to prevent uh, PTSD and suicidal ideations or attempts. And if they do occur, if somebody gets diagnosed with PTSD or has the thoughts or attempts, um, how does, what does the army do to make that not happen anymore? basically and I was not they do nothing I'm in the process of it I'm getting medically excuse me I'm getting medically discharged for PTSD and I didn't have much of a say in that um so it turned uh, that we just started talking and it wasn't a clinical environment it was just talking to somebody who was listening who genuinely wanted to listen and it wasn't their job to listen you know what I mean Mm -hmm. um and it, it it i need this what we're doing right now i need to see you're intently listening to the conversation i need that it keeps me going um or else i'm gonna lose train of thought and then i just won't want to talk anymore so we were texting a lot it was over messaging facebook messenger so i said yo can we just like video call instead skype so we skyped and it was four hours of me just talking about the things i should have been talking about in therapy that just therapy wasn't accessing at that point and I think at that point, like he, he had things in mind already, but at that point, it, it really clicked that, all right, this is kind of, for me, for people like me, at least, who think the way I think, this worked really, really well. So that's kind of how um, I started with Project Grief, at least, how we, uh, how we started that out. I really enter into the picture uh, right at the time that he posts up a, this is what's going on. Uh, I see Dan post up a status uh, that, you know, he's like, hey, everybody. <laughs> Uh, I'm coming back home and um, I, I might be different and I might be a bit of an asshole sometimes, um, but it's because this is what's going on in my life. And I wanted to be open about it and, you know, that with all of you, because, you know, I have PTSD now and if I'm different, that's why. So I was like, damn, that's that's really cool. That's some leadership right there. That's some leadership that he might not even recognize. Right. And as I got to know, Dan. He doesn't recognize it, but um, <laughs> um, like, that's right. But like, so Dan and I were, we were acquaintances um, and now he is definitely one of my closer friends. Uh, it's actually been pretty cool to, as we're growing this nonprofit together, we're getting closer as well as the other people that are part of it too. Um, but, um, you know, I actually started my journey out, uh, you know, I mean, I, I went through some traumatic experiences myself when I was younger. Um, and, uh, you know, not war or anything like that, but, uh, I know what it's like to, you know, have some stuff on your mind all the time. And, um, I have a lot of friends of mine that were in the military and first responders and such, and I genuinely love this country. So, um, I thought all of those things align and I want to help out in any way that I possibly can. And, uh, I came up with some crazy ideas because that's what I do. I come up with ideas and I just execute and I see what works and I see what happens. Um, and it's usually based off of some research that I've done. And I found, um, some unique questions that I like to ask. Um, and the most recent one that we ask in project refit that has actually taken us, I think even further, this one question of, Hey, how many guys served in world war II, and how many guys are serving today? And you'll notice that it was 9% of the US population serves back in World War II, as opposed to 0.5% of the US population serves today. Mm. Why do I ask that question? Because we're trying to combat isolation. And why is that so important? Well, look at that number. There's, you could be very likely the only person that comes back and you're the only one in your town or city that is, has served, right, during that time period. Uh, so what we did is we started to ask even deeper, like, okay, who else? Um, this is the easiest question, actually, of all. Uh, but who else knows what it's like to serve um, that would understand them without needing to be in another country? And of course, it's first responders like that right off the bat. So um, a lot of first responders are also veterans, um, have you know been in the military and such, but not all of them. But even still, uh, they understand each other on that service mindset of why I made that sacrifice, why I did this, why I'm trying to protect the community. It's just a part of the blood. It's just a part of my DNA. So um, that is why we ended up you know, blossoming into what we are today, because we found a lot of different unique questions to ask. And as I began to learn more and more about the, the buddy check process, because our whole entire uh, mission started out, we wanted to build up this mobile application where you just tap a button, you can talk to somebody 
or someone, uh, anyone, it doesn't matter if they're clinicians or not, just like people who care and want to listen to you, or um, you're going to donate your ear. And sometimes it doesn't matter if you're a clinician or not. We just wanted people to be on there to listen to people. We evolved and we learned that, okay, you know what we really need to do? The thing that really doesn't exist is actually trying to help the friend groups stay connected. So we call those friend groups fire teams. So we launched out this mobile application called Blue Skies, where your top five fire team members, your top five best friends are part of your fire team. You add them into this app called Blue Skies, Project Blue Skies, and you can tap a button that says talk, but we're also going to be reinventing it. And we're actually working with Jackson University right now to redo our whole app. Because they built out our first version that we asked questions to people for. And then um, now they're building the second version for us. Uh, and basically, we're continuing the relationship with them, I should say. Um, we're going to be making a radio check tool, which is actually you press the one radio check button, and then it sends an update directly to all your top five fire team members at literally the tap of a button, you can check in on your buddies, right? So it's helping out the friends, stay in touch with the friends at the tap of a button easily. Uh, because life gets in the way sometimes, we're trying to make that a little bit easier for you to check in with each other. However, apps are expensive. So we started to like really expensive because you have to worry about the, the team that's going to be behind the app and building it and consistently supporting it. So the, it's actually the not only the server costs, but it's really the human capital that's super, super expensive because you have some really smart people and trained people who are going to be taking over this. Okay, so where, where do we pay for this? How do we pay for it? Well, we not only wanted to figure out how we're going to pay for it, but how are we going to continue to innovate as well because we do want to focus on in-person connection too and helping guys out in person. So that's how we came up with the idea of the mobile base. Actually, there's a story about how I came up with that idea. I was literally talking to a lady. At a, I was set up a table at an event. I was talking to some people. And this one woman was asking me, like, how are you going to do the in-person stuff? And I, and I literally sat back and I was like, we haven't, I, in my head, I immediately started saying, like, they haven't really traveled down that path yet. And then right across the way, there was like this uh, mobile bar that was there. And it's like, you know, 24-foot trailer with a bar inside of it. And I was like, it's going to look like that. That's what it's going to look like right there. And she's like, oh, that's really cool. And I was like, yeah, but we're not going to have alcohol because we don't really believe in alcohol. We think alcohol is bad. We're going to have that. It's going to be a lounge where you can hang out with your, brother, with your brothers and your sisters and we'll show up directly to you and we'll help them out any way that we possibly can and just show them love and show them community. And um, she was like, wow, that is special. And I was like, that is special. She left and I called Dan. I was like, yo, I was like, Dan, dude, listen to this idea. And he was like, that is it. That's it. <laughs> I was like, that is it. So we just made it better and better and better. And, you know, we recognized that I have to figure out a way to explain it to civilians. I mean, I mean, Cheryl, you understand, you started nodding your head right away. The idea of showing up directly to a guy is like in any veteran and first responder, I think veterans specifically though, understands how powerful it is when somebody shows up directly to you to show you you're not alone. Uh, exactly. And I kind of think that's what makes you unique. Why you think your idea is better than the VA. And in a way, you guys have already answered that because you we're not trying to be better than the VA. No, no, a different resource other than the VA. Got it. I like that. Okay. okay. So <laughs> because I'm not into VA bashing, I've been going to the VA my whole life <laughs> yeah. pretty much. Yes, but yes. I, um, I, uh, the idea here is, is because you offer a local location because you're mobile and an immediate response because people can't wait. And see, that's one of the issues with the VA. You call up, you have to make an appointment. It's not you, sometimes it's not, you can't get to somebody like right now when you need them. So right. those points are what you need to emphasize. And that is what makes you different that's right. than the traditional VA resource. That's so right. it's the ideas. And since, you know, uh, your friend Dan here is a combat veteran, and um, you guys have figured out a very unique way to outreach to your fellow veterans. Because when all of these young men and women start coming back from Afghanistan in the next month or two, 
Now is the time to get this idea into place and make it available. I think it's a brilliant idea. I think, I think it works the best because when we talk about clinicians and things like, things like that, I, I look at that as officer mentality kind of things where we have taken an enlisted mentality kind of things. We, 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 one, we take my, like, I know what certain things, like, I, I know the system is broken and I know there's, there's, everybody isn't an emergency. Everybody isn't about to kill themselves. It's everybody isn't like that. And if we can reach the people who aren't like that yet and keep them from getting to that point, giving them, sometimes people just want to have to talk. Like sometimes people literally just want a zoom with 20 people in it who have been through maybe some similar things, it's not requirement, it helps if they have, and mm-hmm. just talk for hours, weeks, mm-hmm. months, however long they've been doing it in our Zooms. And that in itself is a form of therapy because yes, they have their PTSD and they have their all their other bad things, their amputees, whatever it may be, but giving them an outlet, say, say the Zooms alone, giving them an outlet to have this conversation, it's taking more weight off of what that PTSD is causing. Because the PTSD is just making it 10, 15, 20 times worse. So if you're giving them, it's, 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 it's like one-on-one therapy, but it's group therapy, just unstructured. And I think that's why it works. The unstructuredness of it is why they open up the way they do and is yeah. why the conversations happen. If it was a sit there, hey, all right, we're talking about this today. Who wants, no one wants to do that unless you really want to do that. Like, and then you go to group therapy for that. I know you uh, want to I, say something. I do. Yeah. Actually, I want to, I want to tap into um, another, another thing that's important in my, in my opinion, um, okay. because it's, there's something to think about. Okay. Cause you just mentioned, there's a couple of things that just happened, right? So one, you mentioned how, Oh, all these guys are coming back from Iraq, Afghanistan. Like they're, they're going to come back home. The war is over. And, and Dan brings up how we're trying to bring online, like have the group therapy approach and everything. There's something that used to happen years ago. Let's go back to World War II. Let's go back to World War I. All right. Let's go back into ancient history, actually, because it didn't, things didn't really change for how a soldier would come home for probably, it didn't really change until about Vietnam, right? That's when things got faster, right? That's when getting home became faster, okay? So why is that important? That's important because, you know, the ancient soldier would be able to have their men and their women that they could literally be around, or their men, actually, let's be real here, their men, all right, that they could be around in ancient history, men fought. Yes, I know Viking society had some women as well, but I know that mostly it was men, okay? So those men Mm. would be around each other, And they would 100% have time to when they're traveling back home after a battle where they just chopped some dudes' heads off and legs and other things and saw some of those violent shit you could see, they would actually be able to decompress with each other any way that they possibly could. And then, you know, they'd go back to their home civilian life, right? And the same thing would happen with World War II where a bunch of guys would get on a ship, would take like four months to get home. They would all be there together, talking to each other, decompressing, crying, remembering their brothers whatever they had to do to get it off their chest and getting it done. And before they got home, they had time to decompress. There's a big missing, there's a link that is missing for this decompression for some reason. Because now, you're home, in, sped now up, you're home in 29 hours. <laughs> exactly. Now that things sped up, we are for some reason now saying to our men and our women, you got to push it down because you're going to be home in 29 hours. You're going to be home in 29 hours. In a day and a few hours, you're going to be home. That's crazy, right? And and that means you could literally just get done a mission. And three days later, let's say, you'll be back home in your backyard holding your kid in a barbecue. What? You have no time to relax. So what we're trying to do is, is come up with this way to give these guys a chance, man. Talk to your When you're going through shit, you never had a time to decompress. You're not crazy for needing to cry in the middle of an event, right? You just need help, man. Like you just need to get it off your chest. You just need to talk. Like you just need to. And the help, by the way, isn't like necessarily a psych sitting there in front of you or like talking to you or whatever. The help could literally be you going like, yo, uh, hey, man, like me calling Dan. Hey, Dan, um, can I talk to you, man? Like I just need to get some, like I just... I'm crying right now in the middle of a concert. I don't know what the hell's going on. And Dan's going to be like, oh, dude, yeah, no worries, man. What'd you think about? I'm thinking about my, you know, what? And then you just go and it's like, 
start talking, right? Because you never had that chance. If you don't talk to somebody, you're going to blow up in another way. You're going to blow up. You're going to build resentment. That, that gives you, yes. if you, I, I repressed my things for years. Um, even while I was doing therapy, I was still repressing. I still repress things now. I, I think it's just part of who I am. It's dealing, uh, pulling them out of the repression is what is the trick. Um, yep. But when you repress your, when you repress your sh- that that bleeds over. It's it doesn't just stay with your war stuff. It bleeds over into everything you do. That taints every type of relationship you have. And I'm not talking romantic, obviously that. But friends, you lose friends because exactly you exactly right. I, I guess my my real closing is be honest with yourself. I know a lot of us, uh, me like myself specifically, pushed it off for yep. a while, and 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 didn't uh, didn't have those honest conversations with myself about what's causing the pain. What am I feeling? Am I fe- even feeling pain? Um, you don't have to go to a therapist to have those conversations with yourself. It's just talk to yourself. You're not crazy if you do that in these types of situations. Um, but yeah, be honest with yourself. And if you need some outside help, don't feel like you're a coward or weak for getting it. Um, cause we're adults living in the real world. This isn't high school. So I don't, I don't really know where that mm-hmm. stigma even came from. We're adults living in a horrific world. Get your help. Um, it's only going to make you and your family better. <laughs> It's, I mean, it's, well, it's, it's, it's true. I, I never understood that horrific stigma. Horrific world. <laughs> like, 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 oh yeah, people are going to judge me. Yeah, they are going to judge you, but guess what? Guess what, bub? Everybody oh. judges you for everything anyway, Everybody. so just go Give get me- the f-ing help. <laughs> so, so we're all finding unique ways to make it happen for our veterans. Thank you, gentlemen. I do appreciate you. Um, I think we have more than enough. If we need another Zoom call, I will contact you um, um, and uh, we'll take it from there. How's that? Sounds good. So James, cool. um, you, you go ahead and give him my email address and you can send me whatever pictures you want to send me, Dan. And James, if you want to send me- Dan, I think you have some, it, right? Yeah. yeah some yeah, pictures it, yeah. of your um, um, prototype van or your, the van that you have now and, and, and some like your- logo in the background, uh, we can certainly insert that um, into the video. Okay. Okay. Any yeah. questions, guys? No. Okay. Good. I think we're done. Thank you yeah, so much. Cool. Okay. Thank you. I'll see you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.